Welcome to our April session. Our speaker, Sasha Jolich, is going to talk about design patterns for protecting sensitive data and event-driven applications. Uh, Sasha is a VP of Software Development at MasterCard and founder of Persister, which is an event-driven design, event design framework. Previously, Sasha was the director of engineering at Cater, uh, a local company you may be familiar with, where he built a ride-sharing app as an Uber or Lyft competitor. Uh, he's an experienced software architect and technology leader, and Sasha has worked extensively to incorporate application security directly into the application development process. Sasha and I have known each other for over 20 years. We graduated from UBC together, and I highly respect his work, and uh, very excited to have him as our speaker today. So with that said, over to you, uh, over to you, Sasha. Awesome. Thanks, Farshad. That, uh, <clears throat> that was a great introduction. Thanks very much. Um, all right, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I've got a presentation here that I'd like to run. So let's see. Um, keynote, share. All right, so let me know if you can see this. Should be uh, up on your screens right now. Looks good. To kind of get started, um, you know, most of this, so event driven design is a particular, um, way of building software and I've had uh, different experiences with this over the last, you know, I don't know, decade, two decades or so, but really very intensely uh, in the last few years. Um, most recently um, at Cater, so the last kind of two, two and a half years, we built this ride sharing app and it, it's entirely event EDD based. It's entirely event driven, but specifically event driven design. Um, I'll talk about what it is. Um, so basically, um, what I'm going to talk about this in, in this presentation is mostly some of my experiences and observations from how we approach security with this EDD app. Um, and it might be a little bit different. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't have a security background like Farsha does. Mostly, I mean, my background is mostly kind of software, just general purpose software engineering and product development. Um, and then security something I have had to do. <laughs> um, so, you know, my experience there and observations are kind of from somebody who has, you know, had to implement security um, in, in this kind of framework uh, that's event driven. So first of all, what's event driven design um, <clears throat> or EDD? So it's a way of building software where data is versioned with semantic events. Um, so there's different definitions of what, um, you know, what is, what is event-driven design, what's event, what are event-driven applications, event-driven architectures. Um, event-driven design is a very specific thing. Um, and let me see here. And it kind of looks like this. So you basically have a timeline. So you build your software, you have this timeline, <clears throat> and you have events and they're time-stamped. Um, and so, uh, this is an example of ride sharing. Um, so we have a few events that relate to the customer, for example. So a customer uh, could have signed up to use our app. Uh, then a little bit later, they booked their first ride. Um, a driver came by and picked them up. Uh, they got dropped off at a destination. And then finally, they actually paid their bill and tipped the driver. So it gives you, it's, it's a timeline um, and events are facts about what happened in the system. Uh, each event is essentially a change in state of an object. Um, <clears throat> and this is where the concept of semantic events comes into play because, uh, you know, when you modify an SQL table, you can call that an event. It's a change in state, but that's not really what we mean. That kind of defeats the purpose. What we really mean is it's something that's meaningful to the product, meaningful to the business, meaningful to your domain. Um, so in this case, uh, this particular example here is showing when a ride gets offered to a driver. So we want to um, uh, display some information to the driver, like so who's the customer, where do you need to go to pick them up, where do they want to be dropped off. Uh, you might want to include other things in here as well, like hey, how much money am I looking to make and all that kind of stuff. And that's an event that is meaningful to the product, meaningful to the user, and so that's an example of a semantic event. So it's not, uh, it's not a technical thing, it's a product level thing, these, uh, these events. 
Um, typically, in, a, in an EDD system, uh, there would be some kind of pattern detection. <clears throat> so you'd have this, you, you end up essentially having this event stream, um, and you would analyze that event stream for patterns. And then once you identify and detect the pattern, you would then take action. So examples of that would be, you know, um, when a new customer signs up, you want to send them an email and say, hey, thank you for signing up. You know, welcome to the system. Um, here are some hints how to use a product in the best possible way. So that's a simple one because the pattern is really just one event. Hey, every time I see an event where a customer signed up, <clears throat> that's a pattern, take action, send them an email. But it could be very, you know, much more complicated um, where you could say things along the lines of, you know, hey, this customer um, has signed up. Uh, it's been a week. They haven't actually booked any rides yet. Um, we want to detect that and trigger an action. So it's not just the presence of events. It's also the absence of events. Um, so I didn't see an event in the stream uh, within a period of time, within, say, a week. Uh, I didn't see the event where the customer has booked a ride. And that should also trigger an action. So it can get quite complicated. Now, we also um, are able to reconstruct current state. So typically with event-driven uh, design, uh, so your database is essentially composed of, of these semantic events. Um, and it's great if you want to go back in time and see, well, you know, what happened on a Friday night, uh, <clears throat> what was going on in the system. It's kind of like an audit log, essentially. But if you want to ask the question, you know, hey, how many you know, how many drivers are currently available or how many, you know, how many customers are currently um, on rides, on active rides, that's kind of like querying the system. You're asking it a query and you're expecting an answer back and, and either it is not really designed for that. <clears throat> so you take that event stream and then you build your SQL uh, reporting database and then you query your SQL database like you would in a traditional system. So you can use that event stream essentially to reconstruct the current state. So sometimes when I explain EDD, I, I kind of tell people it's a it's a more foundational technology than your relationship uh, relational databases because you can reconstruct a relational database from the event stream, but you can't go the other way around. So this is kind of one step uh, lower lower level than a, than a database. Um, <clears throat> so kind of. Um, Typically, what you would do is you have um, your users, your customers that use your product. <clears throat> Actions that they take in the system result in these semantic events. Um, <clears throat> they go into an event stream. On the other side, you have consumers of that event stream. And so these would be things like um, reactions, like, um, hey, customer signed up, let's send them an email. So that would be a reaction we want to react to an event. But you also can do analytics. Um, so you can answer questions like, you know, hey, how many signups did we have over this particular period of time? You know, how many signups do we have uh, Friday from 8 to 9 p.m.? Um, and it would kind of be simple conceptually because all you need to do is count the number of events that you see in the stream from one timestamp to another timestamp. So it's, it's really simple. You walk the stream and you just count them. Um, <clears throat> But you can do very sophisticated analytics um, by simply doing that and applying the algorithm. You can do projections, and projections are uh, things like I was just mentioning, where you reconstruct the current state, but essentially you take the events, you project them into an SQL database, or it could be a NoSQL database like MongoDB or Redis or anything along those lines. But you project the data, it's, um, it maybe contains current state. Now you can query that very quickly and, and efficiently. Um, <clears throat> predictions you can feed <clears throat> you can feed your semantic events into machine learning models um, <clears throat> it really lends itself this this model lends itself very well to uh, feeding into machine learning feeding into other st statistical models and um, just predictive analytics in general um, and if you think about microservices and being able to extend the architecture of your system um, <clears throat> the event stream and the semantic events um, are really a great fit for being able to plug in a new microservice down the road um, where all it needs to do is just plug into this event hub and it can then reconstruct any states in, in past um, or your current state as well, just by reading the event stream. So it's got a number of applications. Now, <clears throat> um, 
event the event driven design is um it's not new it's been around for a while but it hasn't really been all that popular um although in recent years it seems like um there's been a little bit more uh talk in the industry about it and and more companies are, are using it um security is an interesting thing um because it's kind of a new technology um there isn't a whole lot there isn't a whole lot of thought given to well how, how would you secure and, and are there any unique um, issues around security when it comes to event driven design. So kind of the, the 10 <clears throat> security principles um, that we all know, I just listed them here. Um, I'm going to maybe go through half a dozen of these um, today and touch on some of the design patterns that, um, that I've used, applied, and, and uh, otherwise uh, conceived, <laughs> I guess, for EDD and securing these apps. So here are some of the ones that I'm going to look at. So minimizing the surface area, least privilege, defense and depth, failing securely, separation of duties, and um, <clears throat> a couple of other ones. So let's go into that. So minimizing the attack surface area. So my first design pattern <clears throat> is um, keeping business logic in the central location. So um, that's an interesting one. You know, you could, it may or may not be controversial, I don't know. Um, a lot of people would potentially argue against doing this um, and uh, decentralizing your business logic and keeping them in different microservices and all, and, and all that. Um, you could do that, uh, but for the purposes of uh, minimizing the attack surface area, specifically to do with EDD, it makes sense to put them all in one, in one place. So now the question is, well, what do I mean by business logic? You know, what, what exactly is business logic? And, and one, one definition of that is functional specifications dictate the rules of the system. And you kind of think of that as, well, maybe that's, maybe that's business logic. Maybe that's what we mean by business logic. There's different definitions of what that is, but I'm going to stick to this one. Um, so knowing that, you know, rules of the system according to functional specs is business logic. Here's a couple of examples. <clears throat> um, Let's say, you know, talking about ride sharing, um, let's say we need to run a credit check because maybe somebody, you know, maybe there's a lot of uh, fraud, for example, and just simply taking in somebody's credit card number doesn't mean <clears throat> that um, the transaction is not gonna fail. It might be fake, there might be problems with it, um, who knows what's going on with that person. So maybe we wanna run a credit check when they sign up and create their account. Um, but return customers don't need to do it. Um, you know, same thing if the credit rating is too low, maybe we don't actually want to allow them to uh, use our system. So there's a couple of rules in there. So how would that, you know, I, I think we're all familiar with how we could implement that in a traditional system, but how do you do that in, in an event driven design system? So <clears throat> you do it by detecting these event patterns. So we, so you have the semantic events in your stream. One of those events is yeah, customer signed up. Another event might be you know, customer booked, booked a ride, paid for a ride, and different kinds of events along those lines. So I wanna know if this is a new customer or not. So I might scan, scan my list, scan my stream. And when I find the event that says, hey, this is a customer that signed up, um, maybe I wanna run a credit check at that point. So it's really just based on examining the events one after another. Um, you might also have another database that's outside of the event stream where maybe you kind of keep a cache of, you know, here's all the credit checks that we've run in the past, just in case so we don't run the same credit check twice. But the trigger, you know, the trigger for running the credit check would be the event in the event stream. And so, um, so the bottom line behind this pattern is having a central event engine where you can process events, where you can detect patterns <clears throat> and process events, um, having a place where you can keep these business rules together. And, and the way I've defined these business rules, really what it means is we have um, a place where we're able to say, uh, able to define what the pattern looks like. And um, I'm not going to go into implementation here or show how this is implemented, but think about it as regex for event streams. So, you know, you can write a regular expression to match a string, but what if you could write a regular, regular expression to match a sequence of events? Um, 
And so you have the regular expression. Um, that is your pattern that you're trying to detect. And then you also have an action that you want to take. And the combination of those two things makes a business rule. And so now you have a list of your business rules, which is really a table uh, where in one column you have all of your different regular expressions that define your pattern matches. And in the next column over, you have what is the action that you want to take. Um, so now that you've defined all those business rules, you can keep them in one central place. So let's say you put them all in one, on one server, you can make sure that that one server is super secure. So you apply all sorts of really um, <clears throat> um, secure practices that you know nobody can access it except certain people and your developers don't have access to it and production and different environments. So you just apply your best security practices to secure that one location, but you don't need to secure all sorts of different places. You just need to secure this one spot because that's where all the business roles live. And so that would be one pattern um, that could potentially help to um, harden, you know, an event-driven design app. Um, so I can't actually see the way I have this set up with my full screen. I can actually see if there are any questions. But if there are questions or people have anything, I'm, I'm happy to take one or two questions as we go along. Otherwise, we can take the rest of them at the end. That was good, Sasha. Yeah, if people want to unmute, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand and then I can moderate and we can unmute and do that. You could also post it on the Zoom chat and I can moderate the questions as well. Awesome. So I'm going to move on. Uh, some of these are, um, I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. So the principle of least privilege, um, another one, and the design pattern um, that I have that matches this one is securing access to streams and events. So, um, I mean, when you think about it, you would go, well, of course you want to secure access, but you know, in a traditional um, system, let's say you think about a traditional database, relational, whether that's, you know, Oracle, Microsoft SQL, <clears throat> MySQL, Postgres, what have you. Um, typically you have a database user and so you would log in with a database user and the database user would have certain privileges that they can do in the database. So they can see some, some databases, but not others. They can see some tables, but not others. They have write permissions in some tables, but not others and so on. With an EDD system, you're not necessarily using a SQL database because it's an event stream and it could be implemented in many different ways, but it probably is not gonna be implemented in SQL. Um, so how do you do that? And a lot of people, when they do uh, EDD, they kind of build their own tool chain. So they build their own um, uh, persistent event storage. They build uh, their own mechanisms for reading and writing events, um, filtering events. So they kind of, a lot of this tends to be custom in some cases. And so um, the, best, um, the best principle here is to ensure, if, if you're gonna do something like, along those lines, if you're gonna build something custom with that, ensure that you're able to define roles and permissions and that those roles can be applied to streams and events. And so I have a few examples here. So role one, um, let's say we have a stream, we have three different streams here that I'm showing. So the stream at the top, you have role one, which is allowed to read from that stream, but it can also append new events to the end of the stream. So you can't go and override something that has already happened in the past. So it's, that's where the difference is between event-driven design and your traditional kind of relational <clears throat> SQL programming where with you know, SQL you can just go to any record and overwrite it. Here, you can't actually go and overwrite anything in the past because the idea is it's already happened and this is supposed to record facts about what has happened. So you're not supposed to do that. Um, <clears throat> but you can record new facts. So that is the append piece of it. Um, you know, uh, role two might be read-only. So let's say somebody, um, some microservice or something needs to access and maybe take some action. But like the example that I had earlier, um, where when a customer signs up, you want to send them a welcome email. Well, you don't, you don't need to change the event stream for that. You just need to listen to events, detect that customer signed up event, and then take action, send an email. So you can be read-only. <clears throat> so you only need read-only access. And you don't need read access to the entire event stream and everything that's in it. You just need read access to the one event type and that specific event type of, hey, this customer has signed up. So your role two might be 
um, might actually have a filter applied to it where um, you can only access the stream and you can only access customer signed up events from that stream and everything else you can't see. Um, and then role three, um, you know, maybe um, you have something that is generating events um, and it so needs to append events into the stream. Um, maybe that's the customer sign up process because something needs to write that customer signed up event into your system. So let's say, um, you know, you're building a website, you have, uh, you have a form on there and it says, hey, sign up as a customer, you know, fill in your name, your email, and there's a sign up button. You press the sign up button, that generates that customer sign up event, it goes into the event stream. But hey, that form, that web application that you just built, you know, to sign people up, that doesn't need to read anything in the database, it just needs to, it just needs to generate an event. So let's minimize access, let's only give it append permissions into that one stream, and it doesn't even need read permissions. So if somebody were to you know, hack that web application and gain access to it, well, they could flood you with customer signup events because that's what they could do. But they couldn't actually steal any data because they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't even have permissions to read anything from your event streams. Um, <clears throat> Role four uh, is kind of actually, I've already mentioned it, where you can filter events in the stream. And then role five is same kind of thing, but you can filter events across multiple streams. So, you know, imagine if you were to come in and say, you know, hey, I, I want to see everything in the, in the database. Like for the entire history of this application, I want to see, um, you know, um, anytime anybody has signed up, anytime anybody has booked a ride, and I want to see all of that. So that's going to be, you know, scanning across multiple streams. Uh, you're filtering by event type, but it, you're going across multiple streams. And, and, and you should be able to do that as well, because that's actually very useful. Um, so these are some of the kind of principles as to how you would secure that. Now, a lot of people skip, skip, uh, skip over this. And, you know, and they'll implement the event stream. And, and, you know, they're happy when it works, but they don't consider security um, at all. So these, you know, this would be my recommendation. So have roles and permissions require a role to access data. Um, if a role is not provided, refuse to provide any kind of access. So require a role to be provided and then have the ability to secure both streams and events in whatever AMI broker you're, uh, you're building. Uh, Sasha, there's a question from Eric. Is it possible to redact delete sensitive information given this set of five roles? Yeah, so it's cool. I actually have that as one of my design patterns. So I'll, I'll get to that. And it's, uh, I think it's a pretty cool pattern. I like that one a lot. So I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, probably, I'm not sure if it's a couple of patterns from now, but I'll get, get back to that. So here's the next one, principle of defense in depth. And the design pattern that kind of matches that one is isolating projections in separate databases. Um, so um, projections, you know, so these are things that read the events and um, take that data, aggregate it in some way, and then write whatever that aggregate information is into some other database outside of the event stream. That, you know, other database could be SQL or it could be a no SQL. It doesn't really matter. It could be flat files too. Anywhere you go outside of the event stream would be that database. So a projection is really anything that, you know, projects onto some other data store. Um, Projections are really useful for things like microservices. Um, if you have a service that, uh, like I keep coming back to this example, a service that you know, sends the welcome email, well that's, that's a service and it can be standalone. It doesn't really need anything else. All it needs to do is to you know, hook into the event stream and filter for that one event type. Um, and that's it, and it just send, sends emails. Um, but it may have its own database why? Because you might want to, you know, keep a record of all those emails you're sending. <clears throat> uh, so you send, you know, a thousand emails, you, you store them somewhere, you store them in another database, not necessarily in the next stream. Um, <clears throat> then you can see, you know, what emails you sent to, to who. Um, you might have um, different services. So in our, uh, so at Cater, for example, we had, a, <clears throat> I think we may have had like a hundred different projection services and so on. In our, in our backend system. And some of those services would interface with third party systems like um, Stripe. Because uh, somebody books a trip, you see an event, your know, customer has booked a ride. Well, now we need to build that customer. Um, <clears throat> so that would be a service. It looks for that specific event in the stream, it sees the booking, 
Then he goes and talks to Stripe and says, hey, uh, I want to capture uh, capture payment, capture transaction on this person's credit card. Stripe says, yay yeah, or nay. You might record that in a separate database outside of the event stream and kind of keep track of um, <clears throat> what worked, what didn't work. So you kind of build your own rule of service. So the nice thing, so it's really nice for that because all of the services are independent, technically independent of each other and nicely separated out. Um, it's easy to extend the system that way too. <clears throat> um, and, but then when it comes to security, the nice thing about this is um, if you have these services and they're isolated, you can also have their databases being isolated too. So again, if somebody hacks into my you know, email sending database, because maybe I misconfigured, you know, my SQL and I, you know, left a very weak password or left a default password and exposed it to the internet by accident. Somebody hacks into it. They can only see the information that that one projection has stored in the database. They can't see anything else. Um, and so this particular service might only store, hey, the emails that I've sent out. So, okay, so they can steal that, but they can't get access to say customer's credit card information because it's not even there. Uh, where's the credit card information? It's in this other service, you know, maybe that talks to Stripe. Um, and so having them isolated like that um, increases the amount of work and effort that an attacker would need to undertake in order to compromise their systems because they can't just simply compromise one database and now they have access to all of it. They have to compromise all individual databases and try to kind of piece together the picture of what's what. So, um, so that's this particular pattern. Um, so keep your projections independent of each other as much as possible. Keep only a subset of data in each projection. And the nice thing about the event stream is you can actually wipe that database and recreate it at any time. Um, so imagine you know, um, the database that uh, you know, sends emails and so on. Well, if I go back, if I go back into uh, my event stream history, um, depending on how much information I've stored in the event stream, you know, I could potentially recreate and see, I, have, I can come up with a list of all the customers they have signed up. Uh, there might be some information that, you know, if, if, if it's not present in the event stream, I'm gonna lose it if I wipe, wipe the projection. Uh, but whatever is present in the event stream, I can recreate without any issues. So if I've had an attacker compromise my database, compromise my projection, and they've gone in and modified it, now I can't trust their data, Maybe I can just wipe it and then just replay from the event stream and recreate it. We've actually done that at Cater a few times um, and worked out pretty well. So the next one fails securely. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> the design pattern, you know, it's kind of interesting. So I'm calling it no action, no harm. But you know, if you don't take action, you can't harm anybody. Um, and it really kind of goes back to this idea of having the event stream and uh, detecting patterns in the event stream and taking actions on them. So if your system um, is meant to um, write something into the event stream and that process fails, and so you end up not writing an event in, then you can't take action. And if you don't take action, you're not gonna be able to cause harm. So anyway, that's the idea behind it. It's not as simple, and of course, I'm sure there's a bunch of edge conditions where you can create scenarios where this doesn't apply, but, but in the general case, that's, that's a fairly solid principle, I think. Um, so for example, you know, signing up a customer, you know, um, if that system gets overloaded and there's some kind of DOS attack or something, and now all of a sudden um, you can't, it, it just crashes and doesn't work properly, it's not going to be creating any events. And if it's not creating any events, the rest of the system will not be overloaded. So yes, that one service is, is out of business, but the rest of it will continue working fine. And security wise, um, it's similar, it's a similar idea because, um, you know, if you're doing something and, um, you're trying to change state. Like if an attacker is trying to modify state, let's say they're trying to you know, steal money from you and they want to make it so that they can take trips for free. Um, they want to increase the balance you know, in their account uh, and, and it's all fake because they haven't actually you know, paid for it. Um, if they're trying to do things along those lines and, and you're able to detect that, so this principle doesn't really, it doesn't tell you how to detect it, but if you're able to detect that and prevent that action from continuing on, 
it's not going to affect the event stream. And if it doesn't affect the event stream, it doesn't affect any of the other services. Sasha, there's uh, one question. Uh, Mark is asking, what, if anything, are the downsides of replaying a projection database? Um, the biggest downside is that it takes time. Um, so depending on um, how much data you have in, in your uh, event stream, it may take time to replay. Um, and there are ways around that. Uh, you can use snapshotting um, <clears throat> uh, to uh, minimize how much data you need to scan to replay. But essentially, think about it as it's a linear scan. So you're doing a linear scan on the events, on your event history, and replaying them. And so be, being a linear scan, um, your time complexity is going to go up linearly with how many events you have in, in your history. Um, but if you, if you employ snapshotting, so let's say you snapshot every hour or every minute or every 10 minutes or every day, it depends on how much traffic you get. Um, then you only need to go back to the nearest snapshot and that's how much you need to process. Uh, was there another question? Uh, there's a fault, Mark has a follow-up. Could you have an event that forks the primary event stream if and when there's a malicious event? Um, potentially, potentially. So forking the event stream is, um, is an advanced concept, you can do it. Um, at some point, you're gonna need to merge it. Uh, the problems you're gonna run into are when you, when you merge the, um, the two different streams uh, back together into one. And uh, now it's not insurmountable. We actually had that at Cater and it happened to us and, and we addressed it in some way. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, for example, mobile apps. <clears throat> so mobile apps are kind of their own little islands of activity and um, so we had obviously our server, we had these mobile apps because that's where customer use, you book your trip, you see the map, you know, you, you get your push notifications where the drivers come to pick you up. But what happens if, you know, you go into a tunnel or you just go into an elevator or you go down into the basement and all of a sudden your internet connection drops or you're on Rogers like me and you just walk around and all of a sudden your cell drops. <laughs> um, so now you're all of a sudden you're disconnected, you're in a disconnected island you're not connected to your, your server, <clears throat> and you, you've essentially forked the stream. Um, any events that you generate on your phone are not gonna be able to be synced in real time. The next time you go online, now you have a, now you've diverged, and I have to merge them together. And um, so there's strategies around that. I mean, if you think about, so we're all developers. If you think about Git, Git has kind of solved that problem, and think of, merging event streams is kind of like merging your two different Git branches. Um, if there's no conflict, you're fine. You can just merge and you're done. If there is a conflict, um, that's where you run into problems. And, and that's typically application specific as to how you resolve the conflict. So for example, if you're building a, you know, Google Docs and you're, you know, you have two or three different people editing one document, one of those people gets disconnected and they continue editing. Now when that person gets reconnected, now you have two sets of changes and you might have a conflict and you need to decide, do, you know, does the system automatically drop one or the other set of changes or do you bring up a pop-up to the user and ask them to resolve the conflict for you? So there's, you know, it's application specific as to how you resolve that. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the next one. So separation of duties. Um, so a very, um, I guess, standard pattern there would be to use microservices, but specifically microservices uh, with EDD. And so here's an example of how we did that. Um, so here's what happens in the product. So the customer signs up and they're emailed a link that they need to click on to verify their account. After they do that, then they go back to the app and they can book a trip. Um, when you book a trip, you don't get assigned a driver right away. You basically just says, okay, you've booked a trip, but we are now looking for a driver for you. Then, you know, it takes a while for us to find, find the closest driver that's available. Then you're notified a few moments later um, that, hey, we found a driver. You know, this person is, is on their way to pick you up. So that's kind of you know what the flow looks like, the customer journey that, um, that you would see on the product side of things. 
But what does that look like in terms of architecture on the back end? You might want to split it up into multiple different services. So let's say you have a verification service and the only responsibility that it has is to verify customer emails. You might have a booking service that is responsible for handling booking new customer trips. And you might have a driver assignment service that actually finds available drivers for that customer. So three different things, three different responsibilities, but they all coordinate to do this. Um, so how would that work in an EDD world? The verification service could listen to the customer signed up event and could also then listen to the customer verified event. So customer is signed up. Now remember that's our form on the website. So we have this form on the website, you fill it in, you press the sign up button, now you're signed up. Um, you get an email with the verification link. Well, that could be handled by the verification service. So the verification service could say, okay, well, I see that a customer has signed up. Let me email them. Let me, first of all, let me generate this verification link and let me send it to them over email. Um, then you wait for the link to be triggered. Once the link is triggered, the verification service goes, okay, well, the link has been triggered. I'm going to write an event into the stream that this customer is now verified. And that's it, that's all that service does. So it's very simple responsibility. Um, the booking service, you know, looks at uh, an event called booking started. So now in the mobile app, <clears throat> um, you would pick, you know, if you're a customer, let's, you know, and, and you all are familiar with, I'm sure Uber and Lyft, but you go to one of those apps and you pick, you know, where you were at, where do you want to go? And, you know, you hit the button and you start the booking process. Well, you start the booking process, we can emit an event called booking started. When ultimately you have chosen what type of vehicle you want, you know, you want an SUV, you want an economy, what kind of vehicle you want, um, level of service and so on. You confirm that, well, now your trip has been booked. Um, so that's what the booking service does. So it kind of helps manage that process. And that's its and the responsibility ends once the trip has been booked. So it just kind of handles those few steps in between. Once the trip has been booked, um, the assignment service then kicks in and it says, okay, well, I see that there's a new trip booked. Let me go out there and find out all the drivers that are available that are in your vicinity. I'm gonna find one, I'm gonna pick one, but you know, I can't just pick a driver. I need to tell the driver that there's a there's an incoming trip. I need to notify the drawer if something shows up on their phone, they can see you know, who the customer is, where they're going, how, big, how long the trip is, how much money they're gonna make, all that kind of stuff. Then the driver accepts or rejects. And if the driver accepts, then the assignment ser service says, okay, well, I've got a driver and uh, let me notify the customer now that I've got a driver. Um, so that's kind of how those responsibilities could look like. And they're all technically, um, connected to the event stream, but they're all filtering and listening to different things from the event stream. So they're trying to detect their own patterns. You know, so the verification service looks for certain events. The booking service looks for other events and the assignment service looks for a completely different set of events. Once they see those events, they do some action. So, so these services are technically independent of each other. The only thing they have in common is they both use the same event bus. Um, they can have their own little databases, their kind of service databases, um, with only the information that they need. So for example, the assignment service only really needs to keep track of which drivers are available. Um, and it needs to see that, hey, a trip has been booked, I'm gonna look up my list of available drivers and find one and assign them. Um, so that's all it needs to do. The booking service, you know, this service may need to interface with the customer's credit card, for example. So maybe this is a higher risk service and you might want to secure it more because it might access some sensitive data. The verification service um, is very simple. Maybe it doesn't access any sensitive data at all. Maybe it has very few permissions. So it's very, you know, you're restricted as to what you can do because it only needs, you know, one or two events and that's all. And it just kind of writes an event back and, and that's it, it's very simple. So now when you've kind of isolated things like this, you think, well, what's the rest that I'm running? So if somebody hacks into assignment service, what can they get? When somebody hacks into booking service, what can they get? When somebody hacks into verification service, what can they get? 
And based on the risk assessment, you might decide that, you know what, the booking service is the one where we need to spend more time securing that. The assignment service and the verification service, well, there isn't much sensitive data there at all, if any. So if somebody hacks into the, I don't care, it's not a big deal. So we don't, we're not gonna spend that effort securing those, but we will spend a lot of effort securing the booking service. Um, and so that's useful for you to you know, decide where the effort needs to go and, and how you, you know, manage and, and, and project manage all of that. And also um, it's useful in terms of uh, actually planning your services. So you might decide that you know, the service that's gonna be sensitive, you know, let's have that service be separate from the other services that are not gonna have send, uh, sensitive data in them. So that way we only need to secure this one, we don't need to worry about securing all this other stuff. Um, were there any questions about this? Yes, there was a couple of questions. One, how do you deal with the massive amounts of data for consistency? Presumably, you could never delete older events. So that's a common misconception that you know that you can delete old events. Uh, it's not actually true. Uh, you can delete old events. Um, <clears throat> so, and I have a very simple example for you. So think about your bank statement. Um, so I bank with, you know, BMO, Bank of Montreal, and, you know, I get, well, not anymore in paper, but I used to get my paper bank statements every month. And what happens when you open up the bank statement at the very top, it says, your opening balance is this much. And here are the transactions for the rest of the month. So they're not going to send me a statement that lists all the transactions all the way, you know, going back 30 years when I first opened my account. They're just going to say, here's the opening statement. So that's a snapshot. That's an example of a snapshot. And you can do the exact same thing here. You can have a snapshot. Um, and let's say you say, you know, you need to make the decision how often you want to create those snapshots. Create them daily, hourly, every minute, every month, every six months, every year, whatever that frequency uh, is. It's really up to your application and how much data you're going to have. So you have to do some calculations there. But let's say you do it every month. Um, so at the end of the month, you would create that snapshot. The snapshot is really current state. It's just current state. Um, and then all of your transactions, all of your events moving forward are relative to that snapshot. Um, anything that's older than the snapshot, if you wanted to, you could delete it all because that's your decision. Um, now, in our case, specifically for ride sharing, we wanted to keep all of the data. We didn't want to delete it, we wanted to keep it because there's lots of value in having that data. Um, data storage is not expensive. Um, you know, we had a lot of it, like we were collecting something like a, t uh, a couple of gigabytes of data every 24 hours, I believe. Um, maybe it was more than that, maybe it was 10 gigabytes, I'm not sure. But it was quite a bit of data we were collecting every day. And I mean, still like the bill for storing all the data was I don't know, 30 bucks a month. I mean, it was, it was very, very low. Um, you'd have to get into, you know, petabytes for that bill to really be substantial. And we were collecting data every single second, like telemetry of all the vehicles, like location, uh, orientation, speeds, all sorts of things every single second. So that's a lot of data. Most systems don't need to collect that much data. Like if you're only collecting customer behavior data, um, it's gonna be orders of magnitude less than that, and it's really not a, a, that big of a deal. There's one more question, Th thanks Sasha. Uh, one more question, would you go so far as validating events so as to account for spoofed events, and if so, how? Uh, yeah, I mean, so you do need to validate events, 100%. Um, now, how far do you go? Um, I don't know, that's really, um, I think that, that depends on doing some kind of a risk analysis of what, uh, what needs you have around validating those events. Uh, in our case for ride sharing, you know, we, um, we try to secure access to the event bus. So, um, so like I was mentioning at the beginning, you have those roles and the permissions and you try to secure access to the event stream. So, you know, any service or any person that needs to access the event stream has to be authorized. And, and so that's pretty strict and you want to make sure that's locked down. Um, because you want to avoid exactly what you just said, you want to avoid these cases where somebody writes an event and it's a malicious event. You know, it's an event that's not supposed to be there. Um, I think that's more of an 
authentication and authorization issue with connected to the event bus. Um, not much different from you know, locking down, say, a Postgres database. Um, how do you make sure that you don't get you know, a rogue database connection to your Postgres database and somebody just goes in there and writes a, a malicious record into your database? Uh, same kind of principle. Um, beyond that, I mean, it's just kind of doing data validation to make sure that you know, when you have bugs in, in code, um, because we all write perfect code the first time around, right? But when you have bugs in your code, that those bugs don't end up um, writing you know, corrupt data into the event stream. So you want to have validation for that. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you. Um, OK, so now this is coming back to uh, the question that somebody else had around uh, scrubbing data. So, <clears throat> so I really like this pattern. It's really cool. Uh, so this principle is keeping security simple. And the design pattern I call it maintaining a safe environment. It's a safe environment design pattern. And basically that's what it is. So, you know, you know in your event stream, you're gonna have sensitive data most likely. Um, could be personally identifiable information, your PII data, could be your PCI, credit card data. Um, and depending on what you're doing and where the data is located, you know, you might have different um, restrictions on what you need to store, who needs to access it, all that kind of stuff. Um, so in our case, we were storing things like customer names, credit card numbers, birth dates, uh, some other sensitive data, because we know, you know, triplication. Uh, we can, by scanning the event stream, we can figure out where you live, you know, because you probably book trips from your home to go somewhere else. So we can figure that out. So that's sensitive data and we want to make sure that's secure. Um, so you want to somehow secure that. Well, here's, here's the safe environment pattern is you have two environments. So one is your production environment and the other one is your safe environment or your production-like environment, but I call it a safe environment. And so your production environment, um, you would detect patterns and the patterns would be, you know, you'll be looking for events where you know um, you're gonna have sense to data. Like customer signed up with, you know, Maybe their email address is a sensitive thing you want to protect, or you know a trip has been booked. Maybe there's a credit card number or something you want to protect. Um, <clears throat> now, um, you want to detect that. You want to de detect those events and take action. The action you take is that you replace the sensitive data with safe data, and then you write it into another stream. So <clears throat> um, imagine these two streams are like two different databases. Uh, maybe they're even physically separate. Um, you know, one could be your primary, the other one could be your secondary. So you're going from your primary to your secondary in real time. So this is all real time. So as soon as you know, an event comes in on your production, you're mirroring that event in your secondary database, but in the process of mirroring it, you're actually modifying it. And you're modifying it where you're scrubbing the sensitive data with safe data. Um, <clears throat> so your customer names, you know, what you might want to do is um, uh, one strategy is you might substitute with a random customer name. So you just know that none of the customer names in the safe environment are real. They're all just fake. Um, you know, it's John Doe instead of, you know, Michael Smith. Um, <clears throat> credit card numbers, if you're storing, you probably shouldn't be storing it in the first place, but if you are, you know, it's all fake in the safe environment. None of them are real. Um, and so on. So now, what do you do with that safe environment once you have it? Well, this is where um, you know uh, you want to protect uh, the sensitive customer data from essentially your employees within your company. Um, so what can happen is, uh, and, and in our case as well, you know we had we had a customer service center, we had driver operations, we had marketing, we had engineering, we had QA, we had you know, 12 different teams and they all had access to data. And, you know, all it takes is one person with, you know, one employee with some malicious intent to go in there and say, um, this person looks pretty cute. You know what? I'm going to get her cell phone number. I'm going to send her a text message and see if she wants to meet up with me. And it's like, that's no, you can't do that. Um, so we don't want, you know, we want to trust our employees 
but we want to not allow them to, you know, we want to keep them honest and not allow them to access sensitive production data like this, unless they're authorized to do it. So I'll, that's a different pattern that I'll talk about. Um, so in this case, you know, you can lock down the production environment. So nobody has access to it except for a few people. The safe environment, you give it to the entire team. So your entire team can access the safe environment. Um, you can reproduce bugs on it. You can do your development against it. Um, you can, you know, test your PRs, you know, merge things, do all sorts of things against the safe environment because it's not production and all the data, all the sensitive data has been scrubbed. Um, so you can do, you know, there's very little damage you can do by, you know, stealing data from the safe environment. Sounds like we've got a couple of questions. Uh, I'm looking here. Yes, the next question. So, okay, if, there, uh, if the ledger is immutable and you can replay it to recreate the state, how do you go back and rewrite history to scrub sensitive data? Will that not break the consumer? <coughs> and then I think the question was already answered. Is that correct? Do you want to elaborate on that a bit more? Um, yeah, so you don't, you don't actually go back in time. So this is all real time. <coughs> So you don't, you don't rewrite anything. Um, so the scrubbing of sensitive data is happening in real time. And in real time, you're mirroring your production to your secondary, to your safe environment. Okay. Thanks, Sasha. There's one more question from Zineb. Uh, what about sending a subset of data instead of replacing data? Uh, well, you can do that too. So that, that's totally fine. I mean, it, it, depends on, um, it depends on your particular strategy, um, how you want to do it. Um, now, the problem, uh, it's not really a problem, but it's sort of an additional requirement on the development team. If you're saying um, this particular event has a few fields that are optional, and now in your code, you have to handle that. So you have to say, you know, if this field is not present, then, you know, do something. If the field is present, then do something else. And so I have to handle that in your code, and you have to test for that, so your test cases increase, and your complexity of the code increases a little bit because you have two separate code paths. Um, <clears throat> so that would be that would be the issue with emitting data. Um, keeping the data present but replacing it with safe data or fake data makes code simpler. But yes, you have that extra data in there. So it depends, you know, what you're uh, what you're comfortable with. I think that that's more of a team preference. Next session. Okay, so I think I've covered all of these points. Um, and uh, I believe this is my last pattern. Um, so um, I really like this one too. This is really cool as well. And it kind of builds on top of the previous one. So fixing security issues correctly, um, you know, this is, this is an interesting principle, interesting security principle. Um, the design pattern that I think matches this fairly well is escalating privileges through a ticketing system. Um, and it, it really works with um, the previous pattern where you have this safe environment. So the idea, so let's go through an example here. So ride sharing, um, a customer calls customer service and says, hey, um, I think I got charged double or extra. You know, there's, I see some charge on my receipt. I just took a trip and I don't think I should have been charged this, this whatever this charge is. And um, so what do you do? Um, so let's say you have the safe environment. Um, so nobody inside the company, you know, except for a few select people are, are able to access the real live production data. Everybody just uses the safe environment. In the safe environment, you can't find this customer because the customer is gonna tell you their real name. So they're gonna say, you know, hey, my name is Sasha um, and I just took a trip and you know, my driver was Mike. And uh, you know, can you figure out what happened with my with my with my receipt? You know, what happened with my bill? And the customer service guy is going to go, well, I can't find the Sasha in my safe environment because all of those names have been redacted or put in fake names, and there's no such name, so I can't actually locate you. So that's that's the problem with that. And um, and the idea here and the solution is that you give you punch a hole to the production environment with a specific ticket. So um, do you know, uh, for example, when you call, um, if you call any of the big, you know, utilities, like you call your cell phone provider or your 
utility provider and so on. And, and you talk to them on the phone and they go, I'm going to have to authenticate you or you call your bank, you know, for online banking and they go, I'm going to have to authenticate you, sir. You know, can you tell me, you know, the transaction or, or give me your, um, you know, answers to your security questions so I can authenticate you over the phone. Well, that's what you do. That's what customer service would do. They would authenticate the customer. The authentication would be prompted by the um, ticketing system. So you would need to have a ticketing system that would, uh, that is integrated with your database. Um, but the ticketing system would essentially uh, say, um, you know, provide answers to these questions. And so they take your, your answers over the phone, they type them in, they go submit. Um, the ticketing system then goes, okay, the questions are correct. Now the customer has been authenticated. So this ticket now has escalated uh, privileges. And so the privileges that are attached to the ticket allow the customer service agent to punch through real production and access live data. And those privileges remain connected to the ticket for as long as the ticket is open. Once the ticket has been closed, um, the privileges go away. And if you want to reopen the ticket, you're gonna to have to re-authenticate the customer again. So this offers a number of benefits. One is um, it makes it so that um, a, you know, a customer service agent can't just open a ticket without the customer being present. Uh, because it would kind of negate the entire point of all of this if you know, the customer service agent can, you know, after everybody goes home, you know, when nobody's looking over their shoulders, they just go in there, open a ticket, you know, hey, I want to talk to this, this person and I want to grab their you know, cell phone number uh, from the system and they just punch a hole into production all by themselves that would be a no-no. So that's where the authentication piece comes in so to prevent them from being able to do that. Um, but you know, a lot of times the customer support person can resolve the ticket directly. So they have to maybe escalate you to level two support, level three support. You go to, you know, you go from customer service to technical support, technical support, level three, and so on. And the privileges are not attached to a person, they're attached to the ticket. So if that customer um, support person assigns the ticket to somebody else. They assign it to say tech support. Now the customer uh, service person drops off the ticket. They can't access it anymore, it's not assigned to them. So they have lost the privileges. But the tech support person that picks up the ticket has gained the privileges because the ticket is authenticated and they can go and access customer data and work, work on the ticket. Um, so that's a really cool pattern, I like it a lot. And it kind of looks like this. So you have your safe customer data, um, on one side, you have a sensitive customer data on the other side, which is probably your live environment. And you have the, the customer authentication that kind of sits in between and acts as a, um, a, safe, uh, a safeguard there. <clears throat> um, and then you have your support ticket. So all these things are attached to the support ticket. And your software developers, customer service, tech support, and so on, are just people that the ticket can be assigned to. Whoever it's assigned to is then able to access their data. Um, Again, that presupposes that your ticketing system is going to be integrated with your database. Um, but you know, if you're building all of this custom, you can build it in such a way. Um, so, um, so the summary behind this one is, you know, tying the privileges to the to the ticket, and uh, also you can scope um, scope the privileges as well. So, um, so an example of how you could scope them is. Uh, where you could, um, you know, as part of authenticating the customer, you can maybe ask a few extra questions. You can say, you know, when did the trip occur? Uh, and the customer say, oh, you know, just 15 minutes ago, you know, today. So the service agent then, you know, checks off today. Um, and then they go, okay, well, uh, what is your, you know, what is the reason why you're calling us? They go, well, I want to complain about the bill. So they go, okay, category billing uh, time period today and then authenticate and now go submit and now those privileges that you have should only allow you to see in the event stream events that pertain to today so if you want to go see events from yesterday you can't they're only scoped to events from today um, and they're only scoped to events that are categorized as billing so if you look at other events that have nothing to do with billing you can't see them um, so there's a couple of um, couple of scoping that you can do here in this pattern. 
Uh, sounds like we have a question. I don't see questions on the chat. Uh, so have we reached the end of the presentation, Sasha? So that's it for the presentation. And I think we have maybe a few minutes left for uh, just general Q&A. There is one from Reza. Thanks, Reza. So the privileges would be dynamic and not related to the roles of the users. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that's a, that's a pretty, um, pretty interesting concept. So you're not, you're temporarily um, adding privileges dynamically. Um, so you're saying, for example, uh, the user, you know, the user account, uh, we're not actually touching the user account, but the user account together with this ticket means that now you can access this extra data. Thanks, Sasha. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see anything on the chat there. Uh, feel free to post or even unmute yourself if you want to ask the question directly. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, that we can uh, allocate to that. Yeah, so I hope this was useful. Um, so here's a bit of self-promotion on my side. So I'm trying to put together you know, a book that talks about these patterns of event driven design. And you know, if you found this useful, um, let me know. Uh, if you have you know, ideas for other patterns, let me know. It's kind of a compilation of different patterns that I'm trying to uh, put together. Excellent. Well, th thanks very much, Sasha. We really um, uh, appreciate the great presentation on this topic. Um, I also want to thank our volunteer board, Jeevan, Amiran, Ardi, Eric, Betsy, Yvan, Hari, and Lita, uh, for making these sessions happen. Um, we would appreciate it if you would take five minutes and complete the survey that was mailed out to you um, via Eventbrite so that we can make these sessions even better for you and our community. And then also, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, don't forget to join our Slack channel to participate in AppSec discussions, meet other people, and generally stay connected with the AppSec community in Vancouver. Uh, details on our chapter, they're on our chapter page, so you could Google OWASP Vancouver and you'll find it. Uh, where you can also sign up for our mailing list, which we send announcements about these events. Uh, so you can find out about upcoming events, presentations or recordings from past events and more. And uh, yeah, stay safe and healthy and we will see you at our next session in May or on Slack, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, so um, there's a question here. Uh, was there any design pattern that you had to unfortunately revert? Uh, so I call my attention because it's a cool question. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if it was necessarily a design pattern, but it, it was, um, there was something actually that happened. So um, we had, so when we, when we started writing the code for these different projection services and so on, and we had like, you know, a hundred different projections, um, we had written it in a way, it was object oriented, and we had written it in a way that we had this base class, projection that other projections would derive off of, uh, which all makes sense, sounds pretty reasonable. But we then built in functionality directly into the base class for um, handling how the data for the projection would be stored, queried, retrieved, all that kind of stuff. And at the time that seemed like, you know, a meaningful thing to do because well, if you have a hundred different projections, you're not going to write that code a hundred different times, put it in the base class, it's there. What we didn't realize at the time we wrote the code, but we realized later is that um, the projections need to have the freedom uh, to choose different data stores depending on what they're doing. Um, so most of our projections uh, were writing into MongoDB uh, but some projections needed to write to Redis, some projections needed to write to uh, an SQL relational database, and, um, and others didn't need a database. Maybe they just need to store data in memory. And so having that functionality in the base class where we just kind of assumed, well, all of our projections are gonna write to Mongo, so let's put it in the base class, was definitely the wrong thing to do. So I think it was more of a, maybe an engineering software engineering type thing that we did wrong, uh, where it should have been taken out of the inheritance chain and put into a uh, delegate. So you have delegates, so you might have, you know, there might still be a projection class that handles a bunch of uh, shared shared things, but then you have a delegate for, um, you know, 
an SQL database where you have a delegate for a Mongo database where you have a delegate for Redis caching and so on. And then you can, in, 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 in the individual projection, you can import the delegate that you want. So that was an interesting one. Yeah, Chris, thank you for answering the question. And there's one more, but we cheat to make it sound impressive. Oh, right. This was about the amounts of data that uh, someone was mentioning that they're using this, uh, this model to store about seven petabytes of health data. And, and he says, but they cheat to make it sound impressive. We saw our ledger multiple times in reality, it's around one petabytes. That's still a fair amount of data as well. That's a lot. Um, I'm curious about the level of access to the data. This way we can define the access level to fields. Yeah, so there was something we were working on actually at Cater uh, before, uh, before I left and, and before um, the company kind of stopped developing. But there was something we were working on that was pretty cool. Um, actually, one of the people on this call, on the presentation, um, Amir, he was involved in that as well. But we were building, um, building an identity service that had the ability to um, define kind of dynamic uh, permission levels. And, um, and then we were also building a control panel and a few different admin level things where you could go in and, and kind of assign these permissions to user accounts and do them dynamically as well in real time. So that, that would have made it quite uh, flexible. Um, I'm not sure if that's what the question was about. But uh, that was interesting. That was from Rosa. Rosa, does that answer your question? Well, uh, yeah, if there's nothing else, then we'll wrap up the session. Once again, thank you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you all.